And thank you for tuning in to our original PGN show, The Poets Lighthouse. You are joining us for the fourth episode of season two. And as always, I am Finn Bell, your host, a poet and writer from the San Francisco Bay Area. Today on TPL, we have Marjorie Cantor. Marjorie is a creator of short literary pieces, public art installations, net projects, creative interventions, and essays. A researcher and teacher in the areas of creativity, writing, intercultural matters, communicative competence in English, language development, and phonology, problem solving, and thinking skills. She is the author of such published works as The Waitress, included in The Radiance of the Short Story, Fiction from Around the Globe, and Impoliteness, showcased at the London Word Festival 2009 to 2010, among other collaborative projects. She was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, but has been a resident of Madrid and Tarifa, Spain, since 1986. Welcome to our studio, Marjorie. Thank you, Finn Bell. It's really a pleasure to be here. Absolutely wonderful. I'm going to go right into our first question. So right on your website, in your statement that greets us on your author page, you say, I write for a dialogue with myself and with others. What do you extract from initial dialogue with yourself that enhances your creative process? Okay, I think... Um, maybe I start with telling you, I was a speech pathologist as my first career and a bilingual speech pathologist. And then I moved to Spain. And my writing started in Tarifa in the south in this small town. And um, it was because I didn't know hardly any Spanish at the time. We're talking 30 some years ago. Mm -hmm. And I needed to talk to somebody. And who did I have to talk to? Myself. Of course. So I was writing, scribbling, not thinking I was doing anything with it. It was just that I had to do it to have mm -hmm. somebody to, and so I scribbled down whatever was bothering me, what things I was observing, what I was noticing, cultural differences, little interacts with people. And at the end of the eight years, when I moved to Madrid, I started rereading those notes in mm. primarily in books, in journals. And one thing curiously, by the end of the eight years, my, many of my notes, although in poor Spanish, were now in Spanish, not in English. But a, as I read them, things jumped out at me and I started putting them down on paper, uh, separate from, uh, from the journals. And mm -hmm. those pieces are the things I started working with. And it's a search for uh, letting go sometimes, distancing myself, sometimes getting inside something and really understanding it. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, I know people say my writing is humorous and maybe I can do it now intentionally, but at the beginning it was just me that was humorous or life was humorous either way. <laughs> yes, I see. Um, I have to ask, are there any of those journals that you have yet to revisit or how did you revisit all of them when you began, you know, forming them into these, um, into these projects and these, these, these separate writings? Did, have you? Well, I have them? a lot more journals now. And okay. I, say, <laughs> I write any place. So nowadays I might in the street record on my phone and have it type. And that's a little dangerous because sometimes it doesn't get it right. It doesn't hear you right. Of course. And yeah. if I don't reread it very soon, I may lose something. I might write on toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything that's... I can feel that. <laughs> um, so I now have massive, and I have right now about seven new notebooks of cutouts I often cut out from um, what I've, t I, I start by writing usually by hand, but then it, it that gets onto the computer mm -hmm. and, and the things that I'm really interested in get printed out and they get often put into a notebook in little pieces on, on uh, a page. And then slowly I work those. 
So did I, I reread what I did in Tarifa? Yes. But might I go back to some of it? I might. Um, might. Or do, do some of those things resurface in my mind? Yes. That I haven't maybe finished a text. Of um, course. Yet. Yeah. Sometimes you can revisit it and it will maybe hit a little differently than it did initially because you're bringing so much more experience to it, um, a different perspective, um, a, a different a, a different time and a different, you know, like uh, um, age, but more of a maturity to when you first started out. I have to point out, um, you reminded me of when I was working at a bookstore and um, we would have to be doing something, you know, active with our hands while we're waiting for, for customers, even if we're posted up front, you know, waiting for them at the cash register. And we would be unboxing things. So, you know, there's obviously the the cushioning wrapping paper, the paper that, you know, um, that accompanies the, the boxes, as well as um, things that we're trying to discard, like old calendars from the previous year. And I would use those um, when I would get ideas for, for my poems. In between, I said, oh, here's some of the, you know, <laughs> the, um, the paper wrapped around. So yeah, and like what you said about toilet paper, any material is is you know usable when you have an idea coming to your, your mind. And you don't want it because I will lose it. It yes. might cycle back, but it might take five years. I want it yes. now. Yes, I, I might not use it now, but I want it saved. <laughs> exactly. I've been known to, um, th and this is terrible. Um, one time I was standing right next to a wall, but I did have a pen and I, I wrote it down on the wall because I, I said, oh my God, there's no paper. Uh, where can I write it? I wrote it because the, wa the wall was blank and white. Um, that's why it's it's dangerous <laughs> in our, our house because we have eggshell. And sometimes I've written over and then I just have, would have to like wide it out with like paint. Uh, right. yes. <laughs> I haven't done that, but well, you never. Yes, know. please don't, please don't, don't follow my lead. <laughs> Actually, the walls need painting, so maybe that would get me to paint it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we will now be taking a short break, but when we return, we can look forward to Marjorie's very innovative approach to sharing her poetry and art. Welcome back from the break. And we have with us today, poet and artist, Marjorie Cantor. Marjorie has an unforgettable and engaging way in which she shares her text pieces. And today we get to experience work from her three books, I Displace the Air as I Walk, Small Talk, and Field Notes, Notas de Campo. Marjorie, we would be so happy for you to take the stage and share this work. Thank you, Finn Bell. Um, it's a great pleasure to share with you, to dialogue with you, and, and I look forward to getting to know more of your work also. Um, so I'm first going to read from I dis my first book, which I published in 2004, I Displace the Air as I Walk. And this, that book is divided into six sections by place where I lived and also time. So this particular piece is set in 1969 when I first came to Spain. The Potato Chip Eater. Madrid, 1967. This American girl walks into a Casa de Comidas and sees this local guy, a Spaniard, eating potato chips with a knife and fork, one by one, all untouched by human hands. She wonders how she will ever manage this feat, acquire the skill, the skills required of this chipped etiquette. And this is also from the same book. Loudly, we dance around each other, neither one saying what we really think. Um, I'll just say this is um, Plaza de, Can uh, de Santa Ana, and I live right around the corner, and this is a statue of Lorca in the front. 
a particular style of giving directions. On the street, I needed to know how to get somewhere. I knew it wasn't far away. I asked this, a local man, for directions. He, definitely, most absolutely, very certainly, told me how to get there. That wasn't how to get there at all. Broken, rupture. The yell came just after the completed silence. And um, this is from my upcoming book, which would have come out before COVID, just when COVID began. And I'm sort of figuring out now when I'm going to bring it out. But it's my first bilingual book. It's Field Notes, Notas de Campo, and the translations or adaptations, really, they're not direct translations. Um, I did the first draft. The artist, Jose Luis Delgado, guitar, um, did a second draft with me, and then a multitude of friends, native Spanish speakers, helped me uh, look at those. And we had a lot of fun often in groups coming up with various ways of adapting the pieces to Spanish. And so this, there's a drawing up in the corner on the left-hand side that is by Delgado Guitart. He did one drawing per text. Still moon, luna immobile. When the moon is covered with clouds, it's still there. Cuando la luna se cubre de nubes, Sigue estando allí. And this last piece that I'm going to read today is actually from um, an earlier work, and it's called Conference Conferencia. She woke up just in time to applaud and then raised her hand to ask the first question. Conferencia. Se despertó justo a tiempo para aplaudir. Entonces levantó la mano para hacer la primera pregunta. I just adore that. And there is something to be said about um, pieces with brevity that I think every poet should re-explore, honestly, um, because it has so much more impact and gives you so much more time to contemplate and observe what is going on in the, um, the poem. My particular favorite, and this will always remain my favorite every time I hear it, was the first one that you shared. Um, I believe you said it was the potato eater. Is was the, potato I just, chip. the potato chip eater. Um, <laughs> just that image was really, you know, great in my mind. It was just this, this great image, this humorous um, situation. And I know you explained this before, actually experiencing this gentleman eating a potato chip with um, utensils that, you know, I've, I've never seen that before, too. Um, I am already appalled when I see people eat pizza with a, a knife and, and fork. So <laughs> I can imagine. But, you know, again, you know, like home that would cooked be done or, in Spain. Traditionally, a Spaniard would not pick a pizza up. They might not. Okay, well, there you go. See cultural <laughs> differences. Absolutely. Um, so but, yeah, if I can just, it, the potato, yeah, go ahead. however, that was not a usual thing. <laughs> so, okay, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, my father-in-law could peel an orange without touching it. Oh, wow. He could put the fork in and it would come out in one spiral. So I had already seen that kind of thing. And I just assumed the potato chip when I saw it was the same thing that I was going to have to learn. But I'm maybe there's right. something to that. And maybe it is a um, a skill that was not taught to us. And it was a skill that was retained from a certain era or a certain generation because my mom could do the same thing with an apple. Okay. You know, an apple has a very thin um, uh, uh, skin and she was able to just get the skin. There was nothing of the, the actual uh, flesh and she would elegantly, very, you know, deftly peel it in a spiral, in a beautiful spiral. Right. Nothing, nothing yeah. missing. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> it I've was never, never passed on to me. Either. <laughs> yes. I think you grow up with it or you don't get it or something. Yeah. You yeah. Do do. I would have just like cut my fingers just a dozen times in the process <laughs> right. with a sharp, with a sharp knife. 
<laughs> so Marjorie, among your pieces that you just shared, um, could you pick your favorite among them? And please do tell us a little bit more about that piece, um, the visual that accompanied it, and why this particular piece is your favorite amongst them. Oh, <laughs> that's a that's a hard it, it, because favorites depend on the moment. No, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like the still moon a lot because um, it's quiet and and it's yes. about permanence, impermanence. Mm. Uh, it's, it, um, it goes back to even my being a speech therapist, where ah. uh, children um, at the early stages, when something's out of sight to them, it doesn't exist. Uh, and also I have a, another piece that's a woman um, who asked me on the train when I was sitting with my boyfriend holding hands, she asked if I had the same moon where I was from. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And she said, um, how romantic. Oh. Um, so there, it's connected with all of that, but I don't think I can really say that my that I have an all-time favorite. Each okay. kind of carries a meaning for me, and it depends on my mood, my moment. Um, Absolutely, I, I I get that, and you know, like hey, you know, like you are a a mother who truly is fair and loves her all her children equally. <laughs> <laughs> I like what you said about there are some I like less than others, but but there are oh, a lot. Okay, okay, that that, that that sounds a little bit more realistic. That sounds that sounds like more like a mother. <laughs> I, I like what you said about the uh, the the moon. Um, you know, there there is a comfort to be found in in knowing that you are seeing the same moon, exact same moon, uh, maybe just from a different angle than your beloved or your your family members or somebody who you are thinking of and sending positive energy to that's what i i like to think um, I that, that we're watching that same moon and i'm sending them energy through the moon and the moon is sending that that same energy it's 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 the little uh receptacle it's it's the it's the phone <laughs> it's the little I, you know yeah it's I, the yeah, transmitter I, there you go with you and actually i just say that i mean I write for myself, which yes. some people criticize, actually, but it's been for dialogue with myself. But when I share it, what I enjoy, I, and and that is, um, I thrive on the sharing because the dialogue yeah. between the readers and when the reader's a poet, uh, it's very special. What's more, on their sharing their perception or their experience or their story that sort of connects with mine. I grew up very shy mm -hmm. and writing helped that. me to connect with people. It, it's open. I didn't start writing till quite late and it really has changed my social being. Um, yes. Um, I feel that too, to a, to a certain degree. Um, and, you know, news alert to the person who criticized you writing for yourself. Well, here's, uh, you know, a news flash. We all writers write primarily for ourselves. If we don't do that, um, what are we, what exactly are we sharing with the world? If we're not doing it for ourselves and giving a piece of ourselves. So that, so that is, that is the primary goal. I, I believe it starts from, it definitely starts from self. I like very much how you said that, actually. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so Marjorie, when you, um, the first time I had the pleasure of hearing you share your poems, this was just a few months ago, actually, and at a different, um, at, at a different venue, was a few, you were featured. Um, I was immediately struck by the humor, and I know you've heard this before, mm -hmm. that was dispersed in the text. Mm -hmm. and how this humor weaves the poem and the accompanying art together. What are subjects that you um, usually like to observe, um, whether they be um, theme subjects or actually physical subjects that you see outside your window? Um, and in these observations that you make, how do you, how do you find this humor? Um. The find, how do I find the humor? I mean, I, I sort of mentioned that early on today. Yes, you did. You I, did. I, I, um, 
I mean, I've Spain has taught me a lot about humor. I could laugh at other people's humor when I was growing up, but I didn't know how to make jokes. I didn't how, know how to be humorous. Mm. And um, I, I came here the first times during Franco and humor was such an important element at that time because people couldn't talk about things yeah. and, or do many things. And that was a way that they could hide things kind of, and express them. And so starting from that point, I just learned so much about humor. But um, maybe I do more now because I've been writing for some time. But mm -hmm. at the beginning, I wasn't looking for anything. Ah, it just okay. sat in my mind. And it was something I had to get down on paper. Mm. Uh, but I'm very interested in the pragmatics of communication. So the intention and the function of what um, what happens in a little interact. So I have a lot of pieces, like the one about on the train about the moon mm -hmm. uh, between several people, where mm -hmm. there's some issue of communication, and often it is humorous in uh, in that situation. Um, but I didn't when I like when I published my first book, I really didn't know that people were going to find it funny. <laughs> or my writing humorous um yeah i, I um i i, I th th what i have to say about the humor is that it's it's very in, insightful it's not you know like some people might think ha ha funny humor no it's just like it's this it's this humor that that is very much tinged with um the with the wisdom of of life if that makes any sort of sense whatsoever um it it is very much injected with um like what you said, you know, the necessary hu humor and wisdom that you find in times of adversity, uh, you know, much like what um, a lot of movies and a lot of um, material did during the time of World War II and the Holocaust. They have to find the light against the dark. So there's mm -hmm. there was that definite balance in there. Um, so going into what you just because you just um, touched on it. And so my next question actually goes perfectly into uh, mm -hmm. what you just said. I recall in our previous conversation that you had um, important that you had talked about the important elements like linguistics and interpersonal communications, how they factor heavily um, in conveying your pieces. What is the impact? What do you believe is the impact of a well placed or conversely, a very ill chosen word or phrase in a poem or story? The impact of, um, well, I guess the first thing is you don't, if it's an ill place, you don't convey what is inside yourself and what um, what you really mean. Um, can we can we learn that you know can we, is that is that a learned thing or is that something that unfortunately you know it innately and if um, if you're not a poet or you're not somebody who understands the little nuance or the connotations um, then you're you're a little bit in peril you're or a great deal in peril. Um, my writing process is like people tend to say writers. It, writing is a lonely business. Mm -hmm. Me, writing is not a lonely business. I guess I think if I wrote novels, maybe I would find it that way because you need much more time and you can't have 50 people reading your whole novel as you're pro working through the process. But my short pieces, I have lots of different people, whether it might be someone on the street, a child, uh, friends, uh, someone I know or someone I don't know. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working on something, I often share that text with them throughout the entire process. Yes. And so I get, I mean, that's part of what I'm interested in in the writing yes. because it helps me to understand um, what I've done with what I've put down on paper, how someone else interprets it. Mm. And sometimes I'll say, I don't agree with you, but then I need to find another five people and see how they interpret it. Because maybe I'm not seeing something that they're feeling or seeing. And I, I need to understand what they're seeing before 
I decide if it works or it doesn't work. I do like that. I, I like that fact of, um, you know, I, I didn't really think of it ever um, in, in that way, how poetry is such a thing, or we as poets, it's such an instant gratification of having pieces that are easy, portable, and able to share in a sooner period than having, you know, novels. And, you know, obviously you can share chapter by cha chapter, but it won't give people a whole picture like a full, work, you know, piece of work um, th that poetry does. Um, and also, like, you know, like you said, um, having the feedback, having the interaction, that in itself is like a communication. It's, it's a form of, you know, of interpersonal communication. So that was, uh, that was, that was, that was a great, that was a great thing that you just said. <laughs> I mean, that's part of what, what writing is to me, because it's about communication. It's mm, and about yes. communication with myself and communication with others. And, um, and, one learns so much from doing it yes. and from sharing it, but but in a dialogical way, not just sharing it to publish it and send it out to unknown people. Yeah, I agree. I, I had my moments in, in the beginning of um, my journey doing poetry where I completely subscribed to that old, you know, belief of being it being a solitary thing. And um, I found out as time went along that it's it's the least solitary thing. You're making people feel, even though you're not um, there with them, you're making people respond. And, you know, as, as I had my own growth in, in understanding what poetry is supposed to be, aside from just being words on a page, it, you know, it incites anger, action, uh, you know, respond, response, definitely, because it is the beginning of, I, I think it's, I always think it's the beginning of action. I think the, our words are the beginning of action. Um, so yeah, that's definitely yeah, something. Or reflection or. Mm, yes. So it, it can go, definitely go those, those wonderful ways, depending on how we, we begin to frame it. And that's, that, mm -hmm. that's a powerful thing in itself, how um, it has both the power to quell, but also to, um, to, to begin, to begin yeah. revolution. <laughs> Words. And connection yes. and yeah. understanding different points of view and finding similarities and sharing. Um, yes. I love it when people share their stories. Yes. That go yes. in some way with mine or in contrast to yeah. my stories. It is a creative communal table. Mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. is. I like to um, phrase it as that your mind, you, you know, from what I've seen of what's on um, your web, your web page, and also what you've shared to me personally, uh, when we had our previous session, um, how your, your mind has this incredible capacity to birth ideas that you manifest into projects. Um, such as your bag stories and the literary walking tour. Can you please tell us a little bit more about these fascinating creative outlets? Okay, I'll start with the bag stories and then mm -hmm. the walking tour. Um, and I can show you just the image. The bag stories came about um, as I was early on in my writing accepted to read as a poet at the Popular Culture Conference uh, in Boston. Mm. It was to be, and was to have been in Boston again this past year when I participated after, for the first time again. But anyway, um, and I said, I can't just read a text. At that point, I only had my text. I have uh -huh. to come up with something that fits with popular culture. And so I came up with this project where I put my text, a text on a card mm -hmm. and then went and looked for an object. Um, that went with the text and popped them both into a bag. And I have at least 120 different stories with objects. And then I have for things like a cat or like the Spanish lady, I have many, uh, maybe 10 different cats or maybe even more than that. I have to start controlling my... Um, <laughs> <laughs> my budget a little bit, but anyway, I have a lot of fun with it. So this is another... Um, Another one, The Light Traveler, which is about someone who carries um, 
two light bulbs in this suitcase. And I, I, something I think maybe I haven't said, but most of what I write is based on real life. I think during COVID, I started during the, I mean, we're still in COVID, but the heavy part of COVID or yes. what seemed the heaviest, that I did a little more inventing because I wasn't out in the streets watching yeah. people and participating with people. And then this one is a button and thread, and it's about a little boy in the second grade who got told to zip up his lips and his ear pulled by the teacher. And it, it, that's something I remember from when I was- That makes me think of Coraline for some reason. Of? Coraline. I don't know. I, um, I, I know, and, uh, and it's, it's blanking in my mind. It's one of my favorite stories, and I and the, the author is blanking, and we need to, we need to both look that oh, up because look it up. yeah, <laughs> yes. I love I love getting new things to read. Although I just ordered five books on. Um... Oh goodness! <laughs> <laughs> I need to catch up. <laughs> uh, and then um, uh, the walking tour. I have many stories that are set in Madrid, in my neighborhood, which is mm -hmm. called El Barrio de las Letras. Oh. which means the literary neighborhood. And it's oh, where, perfect. Um, where the writers of the golden age, so yes. Cervantes and Lope de Vega and all the others, all lived in this neighborhood. And mm. uh, the plays were performed right in front of the statue of Lorca. That, oh, that's exciting. Um, uh, is just around the corner from me. And um, so... Uh, when I, now my neighborhood's changed quite a bit, but particularly mm -hmm. the first 10 years, um, there were just all these local people and some tourists who I encountered, either I intervened with them in some way or they intervened with me or I observed it. And so those stories happened in front of or inside different stores or by the Lorca statue. And so I take people around the neighborhood, show a little bit of the history, but not a lot. And then we read, I read some, and the people who are with me read some of my texts that happened. So by the Lorca statue, uh, a man came up to me um, and blessed me. And I won't tell you what uh, the whole story is about, but because um, it's a little bit longer, but um it, it was a very impacting story on me. And so I, that's usually where I start. And then inside the Cerveceria Alemana, which is a beer hall mm -hmm. that Hemingway used to visit, actually, mm -hmm. that's right in front of the, there's another piece um, that in Spain, you often talk about um, cafe being your office. Uh, because particularly, maybe nowadays it's not as usual, but when I first came, for sure, people couldn't afford to have an office or didn't have an yeah. office when they were trying to. So you went and had a coffee and you did your business there. You had your appointments there. And so that piece is about my using um, the Cerveceria Alemana as my office. Um, I like the idea. We should all have an office at a cafe somewhere in... Yeah in Madrid, it will enhance um, productivity. I did um, read a story in college, a fictional account of, um, of this encounter that, um, that Hemingway did have at a particular, you know, cafe where, you know, a lot of like d discussion was going on, you know, uh, you know, I, for, for all I know, it may have been fictionalized, but it might have had a little, you know, thread of truth, mm -hmm. just like, Pretty much like you know, like Capote and and his his interviewer is afternoon with with Marilyn. Um, I, I our wonderful producer said that the author of Coraline is actually one of my favorite authors, um, Neil Gaiman. <laughs> I, I, I do not know it, and yeah. I will definitely look at to it. It's delightful. Um, it's it's like the sister, the twin of of your of your thread and um, a needle uh -huh. story, Good. right? Fantastic. So um, I had such a wonderful time. This is a great conversation. I love the way that it flowed all the directions, the many directions um, that we went. Um, I, I'd love to, for it to, to go on longer, but unfortunately we are at our end of our interview. But I wanted to end our interview with 
one last question as I am, I usually do <laughs> with my interviews. And it's usually something that's fun um, or inspiring for our audience to take away. Uh -huh. So Marjorie, if you would finish this sentence for me. Okay. Today, I was met by. Pleasure. Ah. <laughs> and that's being here. <laughs> really? That's so Thank you so much. Yeah, it. I was met by pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. And wonderment and um, a brand new sense of childlike um, um, joy. Joy, just listening uh. to, to your stories and your stories about stories. Mm -hmm. um, masterful storytelling. You are um, just... In, in a class of your own. <laughs> a great big thank you to you, Marjorie. Um, and always a thank you to our amazing and very faithful listeners of the Poets Lighthouse. Please go to marjoriecantor.com. That is M-A-R-J-O-R-I-E Cantor, K-A-N-T-E-R.com to find out more details about Marjorie's various projects. We hope you continue to show your love to the Poetry Global Network by tuning in to all our original programming on YouTube and subscribing to our channel. We hope that you have a amazing, amazing, wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs>